Could ETH eventually overtake Bitcoin? That's one of the most common questions I tend to get asked, and it's one that seems to be gaining more and more traction these days. Whether we will really see a flippening depends on a number of factors. Everything from broader institutional adoption to protocol upgrades. Upgrades that could really be a game changer for the network. In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at some ETH valuation metrics and exploring some of the latest adoption trends. I'll also break down some of the most exciting updates and developments and what I think all this could mean for the price of ETH. So, if you're on the fence about ETH, this video cannot be missed. Welcome. I am your butler today, and I will be taking you through the menu at our marvelous establishment. Firstly, it is of utmost importance that you adhere to protocol. I may be your crypto butler, but I am not a financial advisor. That means that all the beverages you are about to consume are for educational purposes only. If financial advice is what you're after, we will kindly request you to try a different establishment. Now, with those pleasantries out of the way, I would like to say good day. My name is Guy, and over here at the Coin Bureau, we strive for excellence in everything we do. Be it news, reviews, or overviews, it's on our silver platter of crypto knowledge. If you would like to become a member here, then you can reserve your spot by gently tapping that subscribe button and, of course, ringing that bell. I respond well to bells. One more thing, if I may. Please direct your gaze to these magnificent timestamps in the video timeline. Those are there for your convenience, should you wish to skip ahead. Although, such behavior is frowned upon here at the Bureau. And now, ladies and gentlemen, dinner is served. Perhaps one of the best places to start on our ETH journey is with the opinion of a former Bitcoin maxi, and that would be Arthur Hayes. Now, for those of you who don't know who this is, he was one of the co-founders of BitMEX and is currently fighting a lawsuit that was brought by the Department of Justice and the CFTC. But that's neither here nor there. What matters is that he was once an ardent Bitcoin maximalist and called Ethereum a scam in the early years. However, in this recent blog post of his, he seems to have changed his tune and makes one of the most bullish cases for ETH yet. Unsurprisingly, the entire piece makes the case for Ethereum when it comes to the potential of decentralized finance. More specifically, DeFi can completely replace the system of trusted gatekeepers we have in the traditional financial system. Now, essentially, to transfer away from a, quote, accredited cartel to a network of self-interested, profit-seeking participants has wide-ranging implications. He breaks it down by taking a look at the current banking system and its valuation and performance based on its share price. Now, unsurprisingly, the banks have been performing pretty poorly over the past decade. From the US banks to those of China, Japan, and Europe. An abysmal performance from a once towering industry. Just try to picture that. This is the sector that caused the 2008 financial crash. They have honed the craft of privatizing gains and socializing losses. However, despite this, they have still been unable to capture any value for their shareholders. To quote Hayes, that is pathetic. So the question then becomes, what services are these banks providing and can they be replicated in DeFi? Well, indeed they can. Savings accounts can be replicated with stablecoin that's lent out on a decentralized protocol. Checking accounts are as simple as your own offline wallet. Store your stablecoin there and use it to transact as you would a traditional bank card. You can also take out loans in DeFi by putting up crypto as collateral. Except in this case, you don't need to run credit checks, etc. All you have to do is supply the crypto and leave the smart contracts to manage the collateralization of said loan. There are also certain trust services that banks perform. These include certifying your net worth, income, or banking record. On the blockchain, everything is completely open for all to see, from the amount in your wallet to the funds flowing into it and the history of said wallet. So, TradFi is completely replaceable. And what do they charge or tax consumers for the benefits of being able to provide these totally replaceable services? Well, 
According to the piece, it was $2.68 trillion in 2020, which is the equivalent of 2-3% to of the entire global GDP. Okay, so that's the lay of the land in traditional finance. Inefficient and completely replaceable by DeFi. Now let's take a look at some ETH valuation. As we all know, fees are required on the Ethereum network in order to do all the things that we do in DeFi. These gas fees can be considered analogous to the fees you may have to pay in the TradFi space. Something that you can therefore look at from a valuation perspective is the total value of the network compared to the amount of fees generated. You can think of this as the price to revenue, which is often used as a traditional financial multiple. This ratio has obviously progressed over the years, and this chart gives us an overview of what it looks like over time. At the time of this analysis, the price to revenue of ETH was sitting at 98. This is far off the mean ratio of over 1528 and the median of 430. What this implies is that if ETH was to even revert back to its mean ratio, it would imply a price of over 32k, and if it were to revert to its median, it's over 9k. So, that's pretty interesting. Now, of course, it could be slightly inaccurate to compare market-related stats from 2017 with those of today. So, Hayes then looks at the stats for last year. Here you have the price to sales ratios. For the purposes of this analysis, he makes use of the median, which seems reasonable. He then uses this ratio as a method to project out prices, assuming that DeFi was able to capture a certain percentage of revenue from these traditional finance guys. These numbers are pretty crazy, I will admit. For example, let's assume DeFi was able to capture 1% of TradFi's revenue. It would imply a market cap of $4.6 trillion, or a price of over 40 k Even if you think that is incredibly ambitious, and DeFi was only able to capture half of that, we're still talking a price of over 20 k How much of the market share you think DeFi can capture from traditional financial institutions is for you to decide. Hayes thinks 0.5% is reasonable, and to quote the swashbuckling billionaire Bitcoiner, when you take a high-level approximation that shows you'll make money even when you're assuming the worst-case scenario, get long on whatever the f*** you're valuing. I also happen to think that this 0.5% level is totally reasonable, and that's why I hold ETH in the proportion I do in my portfolio. But it's not just me or you, though. The increasing institutional adoption of ETH is still growing at a feverish pace. So, let's take a quick look at that, shall we? Now, we can't start off talking about institutions without talking about Goldman Sachs, the poster boy of Wall Street. For those of you who have seen my recent video on Goldman Sachs and crypto, you'll know that these guys have completely changed their tune on crypto. And that video is in the top right, in case you wanted to watch it a bit later. As I pointed out in that piece, their head of commodities research was more bullish on Ethereum than Bitcoin, and that was mainly down to the utility that there is on the network, that there are more use cases for it. As a commodities researcher, he holds the view that any store of value needs to have an alternative use case as well. Now think about gold for an example. It also has an end use case in that it can be used in jewellery. In the case of ETH, it can be used in order to pay those gas fees that are required to execute smart contracts. But apart from that Goldman client report, there was also this portion that was leaked from an internal report. It claims that Ether beats Bitcoin as a store of value. They also claim that there is a high likelihood that it could overtake Bitcoin as the dominant store of value. Their argument hinges on many of the same factors that I've talked about before. These include DeFi and NFT demand, where Ethereum is still the dominant smart contract blockchain. They also raise the point of the Ethereum blockchain being used to tokenize other assets and make them more transferable and easier to store. Now, of course, we've seen this recently with none other than tokenized Bitcoin. Demand for it has been skyrocketing, and that is almost exclusively on Ethereum. They, of course, expand on this point, talking about the potential to store and trade any type of asset, as well as intellectual property, etc. So, given this view that Goldman had both in public and internally, it was only logical that they would start offering ETH-based investment products. About a week ago, it was revealed that Goldman was starting to offer Ether futures and options to its clients. What's more surprising than this is the fact that this is even before they have these instruments for Bitcoin. 
The only Bitcoin trades they've so far done are BTC-linked exchange-traded notes. What's also important to note, though, is that Goldman will only offer products they know their clients are willing to trade. So the fact that they jumped the gun on Ether shows where most of the institutional demand is coming from. And it's not just one Wall Street bank that takes this view. A prime Goldman competitor on Wall Street is, of course, Morgan Stanley. This bank has been investing in cryptocurrency-related businesses and has also expanded its fund options. However, when it comes to its view around which cryptocurrency will perform better, ETH is the clear winner. One of the first points that they make is that the amount of trading volume in ETH was higher than that of Bitcoin, and this despite the latter having a market cap almost double Ethereum's size. This is important, as being able to source adequate liquidity for large trades is one of the most important things that institutional investors are looking for. If you know that the trades you're likely to place are going to move the market considerably, then the size of the orders that you can place will naturally be limited. Apart from this point on liquidity, they also give a number of other reasons as to why they think it could outperform, including those other points that I raised earlier about its use in DeFi. If the views of GS and NS were not enough to make you think twice, we also have JPM. Yep, in April of this year, JP Morgan also noted ETH's outperformance of Bitcoin and brought it down to that increased liquidity in the market. They also raise an important point about this increased liquidity as it relates to the futures market. Essentially, the more liquid the markets, the less of an impact cascading liquidations will have on the spot price. Now, this is something that we've seen happen on numerous occasions with Bitcoin. Oh, they also mentioned DeFi, of course. It's hard not to when talking about Ethereum. And while we're on that topic, I want to bring your attention to this recent story in Bloomberg. The folks over at GS have recently used the private blockchain of the chaps over at JPM to complete a repo blockchain trade. Essentially, they swapped a tokenized version of a US Treasury bond for JPM coin. Since this network went live in December, $1 billion a day has been traded through this Onyx blockchain platform. I bet you can guess what blockchain Onyx was built off. Yep, that would be Ethereum. Okay, so that's the perspective of the chaps over on Wall Street. But they're by no means the only institutional investors licking their chops over Ethereum. The first things I want to bring your attention to are these two most recent CoinShares reports. They break down the total amount of funds that have been flowing into crypto institutional products. These are products such as trusts, ETPs, ETFs, etc. Basically, products that have a fund structure that hold the crypto for the investors. In the week ending the 1st of June, funds flowing into Ether investment products were the highest of the lot. In fact, it saw over 27% of all investment flows over the period. Now, this is in contrast to Bitcoin, which actually saw outflows during the period. Then, just the week after, we saw that trend continue. Flows into Ether were almost three times all the other flows combined. In the case of Bitcoin, on the other hand, we saw outflows of over $140 million. So it's pretty clear that even in the most recent few weeks where markets were in a lackluster state, these institutions were stacking ETH and adding it to their portfolios. And these institutions are not just picking up ETH in order to sit on it. They want to use that ETH in order to earn some of those juicy staking returns. According to this recent article in Coindesk, banks are looking to provide staking in ETH 2.0. Companies such as Blockdemon and Bison Trails will provide the infrastructure required for these large investors to be able to stake. You also have two digital asset banks in Switzerland, Signum and Siba Bank, that will begin offering their clients staking opportunities. This could be a particularly strong competitive advantage because they are competing against traditional banks in Europe where interest rates are negative in some cases. Moreover, the fact that these banks will be staking ETH in Ethereum 2.0 is an important consideration for the supply of the currency, something that I'll be covering in a bit. But speaking of supply, that's a really important segue into some of the most important upgrades, starting with London. Yes, my hometown is the namesake of one of the most consequential and controversial Ethereum upgrades to date. 
I am, of course, talking about EIP 1559. Now, if you've been watching this channel for any significant period of time, you're probably no stranger to this Ethereum improvement proposal. I'll leave links to some of my other Ethereum videos in the description so that you can better familiarize yourself with it. As a quick overview, it's the update to the Ethereum gas fee market that will see a dynamic base fee introduced. This base fee will be determined by the market conditions and will eliminate the potential for people to bid up transaction fees by bidding up the gas fees. But that's not the most exciting thing about EIP 1559. It's what will be done with the base fee, that is. They are going to let it burn, baby, burn. The burning of the base fee will mean that the ETH spent on that gas will be destroyed forever. This therefore means that with each and every transaction, a certain amount of ether will be burned. Now, of course, this will have an impact on the total outstanding supply of ETH. The more that the network is used, the more ETH that's burned, and the less the supply. To give you an indication of just how much this could impact the supply of ETH, you can take a look at this chart on June Analytics. It gives an overview of the amount of ETH that would have been burned had EIP 1559 been implemented last year. As you can see, if it had been implemented in June of 2020, we would have had over 2.9 million ETH burned already. That's over 2.5% of the total ETH supply. So let's do a bit of quick math, shall we? Total Ether issued over the past year accounts for about 4.9 million ETH. That would imply that the yearly inflation rate of ETH in the period was about 4.4%. However, if EIP 1559 had been active, that would have implied that annual ETH inflation rate would have been only 2 million ETH, which is an inflation rate of only 1.7%. This is almost exactly the same inflation rate that Bitcoin has had over the past year. So, once EIP 1559 has been implemented, it will neuter most arguments that crypto is an inflationary asset and can't be sound money. However, there's one more thing to take into account here, and that is that the Bitcoin emission schedule is completely predictable. You know exactly how much will be issued and nothing will change this. When it comes to ETH post upgrade, things are actually quite different. If the demand to use Ethereum is to be so great, it is possible the amount burnt can completely counter block rewards. What that means is that Ether could actually become deflationary. That's right, ETH supply could become negative. Now, of course, I don't need to tell you about the impact of reduced supply on an asset with a high demand. Sick gains. Now, of course, not everyone was happy with the IP of 1559. That is because over 1 billion was earned in fees in May. Once it's implemented, the bulk of this is going to be burned and won't be accruing to the miners they will have to rely on tips, which are likely to be a lot less generous. Despite this, though, it does seem as if we are go for green towards the end of July or early August. The core developers are committed to that timeline, and it officially went live on the testnet only a few days ago. So, all eyes are on London. God save the Queen. But, lest we forget that EIP 1559 is but only one upgrade in a raft of changes that are slated for Ethereum. ETH 2.0 is that 500 pound gorilla waiting in the wings. That's right, this is the upgrade that will see Ethereum move to proof of stake, as well as a number of other changes, including sharding, etc. Now, I won't go over it all here, but feel free to watch any of those ETH 2.0 videos of mine if you want the full DL. As you no doubt know, ETH staking went live in December with the ETH 2.0 staking contract. Since that time, the total amount of ETH placed in the contract is at all-time highs, with over 5.5 million ETH locked up. This is important to note, as the ETH that's locked in this contract is completely illiquid. This will have to be locked until ETH2 tokens are released. By most estimates, this is only likely to take place towards the end of the year. So, what you have is a situation where more and more ETH is being taken away from the circulating supply at about the same time that EIP 1559 is about to drop inflation, a double whammy. But the ETH staking contract is of lesser importance than what Ethereum 2.0 will actually bring. It will transition Ethereum to a proof-of-stake blockchain, which will permanently eliminate the need for wasteful 
and slow proof-of-work mining. On top of that, by breaking up the Ethereum blockchain into numerous shard chains, network throughput will be supercharged. This is all because of the parallel computations taking place at the same time. Once these upgrades are pushed, the network will be able to scale exponentially. This will make it more compelling as an alternative to centralized finance. Now, if we were to consider the argument made by Hayes at the beginning of this video, 0.5% of market share may be too conservative. It's super exciting and is a reason why I am so bullish on ETH, irrespective of the network congestion we sometimes see. And while the skeptics may say that ETH 2.0 is still a long way away, it actually really isn't. For example, more recently, key Ethereum researchers had voted to push the proof-of-stake merge to phase one of the ETH 2.0 roadmap. Now, what that mumbo-jumbo means is that they're going to make the proof-of-stake change before sharding, and that could come before the end of the year. As a senior ETH researcher, Justin Drake said, he is, quote, confident we can ship the merge in 2021. You should also take a look at this chart by Drake, who shows Ethereum's ultrasound barrier. Basically, it shows the levels that we would need to reach in fee volume in order for ETH to start becoming deflationary. They call it ultrasound money as a slight swipe at Bitcoin. The latter is always referred to as sound money given its capped supply. But, quote the VDOG himself in a recent podcast, if Bitcoin and its fixed supply is sound money, then if you have a decreasing supply, does that make Ethereum ultrasound money. Well, that's it for most of the video, folks. I have a few closing thoughts for you, though. Ether has a unique investment case that's not really met by many digital assets in the space. It is a utility token that's being used to fuel a decentralized finance revolution. A DeFi future which will clearly expose the inefficiencies of traditional finance. And, as shown, if it captures only 0.5% of TradFi's market share, demand for ETH could skyrocket as people demand more of it to pay for fees on the network. This realization is the reason that institutional investors are lapping it up. This realization is the reason that Goldman has dived right into Ether options before offering them on Bitcoin. Now, of course, a lot of it does hinge on the upcoming updates. Pushing forward such fundamental upgrades won't be an easy feat on a network worth over $300 billion. But they are necessary. And if they are fully implemented, who knows how much this could impact the price of ETH. EIP-1559 will see millions of ETH burned every year, and ETH 2.0 could actually supercharge that number. And not only will 2.0 further this ultrasound money narrative, but it will make using the Ethereum network a breeze. Quick, cheap, and infinitely scalable. This is the reason why I'm so bullish on ETH and why I'm so excited about the next few months. It's not hopium, though. I know there will be challenges. I know there could be delays, and there's always that tiny black swan risk that could see ETH go to zero tomorrow. But I have weighed up these risks with the rewards, and I encourage you guys to do so too. That's it for my video today, my fellow cryptonauts. I would love to get your input, though. Anyone else bullish on ETH? Can a guy get a price prediction? Fire them into the comments below. Then, while you're down there, you just cannot miss my socials page. This is the page that has the only official links to the only places that you can follow me off YouTube. They include my Telegram Insider channel for market thoughts on the daily, Twitter for news and announcements from yours truly, Instagram and TikTok for behind the scenes views, memes, and general banter. And of course, my email newsletter. This is my once weekly take on the crypto markets, as well as some top tips. Oh, and I also give you guys a sneak peek into my personal portfolio. Links to all that good stuff right at the top of that description box. Finally, I'd like to thank you all so much for watching. If you'd like to send good tidings my way, hit that like button. It would be extra special if you hit that subscribe button and turned on notifications. You won't want to miss what else I have coming. This guy's got a dash. See you later, chaps. Thank you.